Daniel, did you want to say something about the importance of leaking? <laughs> yes, the um, Stephen Aftergo, who writes for the Federation of American Scientists and does a thing called um, Secrecy News, which is an indispensable newsletter about what's happening in the field of classification yeah. and secrecy in general. So I, I read it regularly, and it's very good. But he hasn't had a clearance himself. He hasn't been inside the system himself. I don't think he or most people who haven't been inside can really fathom how corrupt that system actually is. And they think of the occasional hiding of mistakes, crimes, aggression, torture, things like that, as aberrations of some kind that could be and should be eliminated by a better classification system that doesn't classify as much. And their emphasis is entirely on the idea that too much is classified. And why is that bad? Well, one of the major things they point to is that if, in the words of Justice Potter Stewart in the Pentagon Papers case, if everything is secret, nothing is secret, meaning that people lose respect for the system. And the implication is that they leak indiscriminately because they don't take it seriously because so much is classified. Now, that's absolutely ridiculous. The truth is that far, far too much is kept secret indefinitely. It's not a question of there being too many leaks, and the way to correct that is to have a system with far less classified and then far fewer leaks. The truth is that what will be protected if you have a classification system is, above all, the information that might embarrass the people who are writing the documents, the people who are in charge of the policy, might show them to have been criminals or reckless, as is often the case. And remember, a lot of that isn't clear at the time. Some of it is, but much of it isn't. You can't easily tell at a given moment what particular document will come back to bite you, how it will fit into, let's say, a pattern of deception. For example, you make predictions in all good faith, or not, <laughs> perhaps for self-serving purposes, but you make predictions, and you can't really be sure which of them is going to look awful. Some of them are bound to be wrong, and everyone understands that, that uh, errors and false predictions are inevitable. But some predictions are going to look really bad. Better to not have those available to the public at all. Classify everything and then it can't come back to bite you. It can't embarrass you later if people don't know that piece of information exists at all. That's why so much does get classified, precisely because it might be incriminating or embarrassing or disadvantage you in, your, in the rivalry for your job, whether from a different party or within your own party. That's the bulk, really, of the documents that remain classified for a long period, and that, in turn, is almost all documents. They generally do remain classified much, much longer than any period which could be said to justify secrecy. As Dean Griswold, who represented the government in the Pentagon Papers case before the Supreme Court, many years later admitted not only that nothing in the Pentagon Papers, which he had tried to suppress for President Nixon in an injunction, None of that harmed national security. He had, of course, testified precisely the opposite at the time. If he'd said that at the time, there wouldn't have been my trial. I would have been off. But years later, he said, not only was there nothing there that harmed national security, he said, but in my experience, he said, very little deserves classification from a national security point of view, more than a very brief period of time. Take, for example, uh, an example that people often give of what needs to be classified the place and time of the Normandy invasion. Now, I don't know who would disagree uh, with that. I, I, I <laughs> it's just possible that Julian Assange would disagree with that. I don't know. But uh, not many people would disagree that that deserved secrecy before, when was it, June 6th, I think, 1944, where the invasion was going to take place and, and the exact time that it would take place. How important was that secret on June 10th, after it was quite clear where the invasion had taken place? Remember that even for a day or two, the Germans were kept uncertain as to whether this was the really main invasion or perhaps it was a feint of some kind in the main 
effort would come elsewhere. But within weeks, to say the least, probably hundreds of thousands of pages that were marked secret or top secret involving that invasion no longer required any secrecy at all. There was no, no need for it. The whole world knew that secret. How long did those top secret stamps remain in effect or secret? My guess is 30, 40 years, probably, adding to the perhaps trillion pages of documents that remain classified. Uh, people like Steve Aftergood and others in criticizing the classification system will quote officials, all of whom say there is over classification and that it goes uh, too much is classified. And sometimes they'll make uh, what seem like dramatic estimates of the amount that doesn't any longer need classification. It might be, they say, as much as 20%, 30%, even 50%, which looks pretty radical. Half of what is classified no longer deserves classification. That's a very, very misleading estimate. In my trial, the man who had written a number of the classification regulations for the Department of Defense, William F. Florence, had testified before the House uh, Operations Committee and then testified in my trial as to his estimate, having just retired, of the amount that deserved classification by the criteria of the classification system. Top secret poses the threat of exceptionally grave damage to our security or our diplomatic relations, for example. Secret, less grave, but still serious, and so forth. His estimate was that perhaps 5% of what was classified deserved classification at the time it was classified. And that after months or a year or two, he said two or three years, perhaps one half of 1%. My experience would suggest that those are not extreme estimates. That seems quite realistic. In other words, one out of every 200 pages after a few months deserves classification. Remember that when the Pentagon Papers came out in 71, some of it was just three years old. It was all top secret. Not one paragraph was ever shown convincingly to have harmed national security. A very large fraction of what is classified will be strongly protected, not because it threatens national security, but because it threatens the job security of bureaucrats and politicians in the system. And that is uh, the criterion that recounts for most of the secrecy. Now, that includes, then, an enormous amount of information that the public needs to have if they're to be sovereign public and a democracy. Only an informed public can be said to have an effective or useful influence on foreign policy, on domestic policy, on an ability to evaluate the performance and the aims and the values of people who represent them in order to replace them in elections or otherwise, and to lobby them and influence them in various ways. And precisely the information that they need is what is protected in the national security field by the classification system. Obviously, there is a great deal of secrecy, including wrongful secrecy, outside the classification system, which applies only to the so-called national security area. Corporations with no classification system keep all too many secrets and kill all too many people as a result. The tobacco industry for half a century lied in saying that they did not regard their product as carcinogenic or addictive knowing from studies internally that it was both of those. They committed perjury when they made that statement under oath in recent years. And the documents that someone leaked, Merrill Williams, a paralegal for Brown and Williamson, leaked about 4,000 pages of documents that proved that they were lying about that. And that was the basis for many class action suits. Those lies were costing 500,000 deaths a year in America alone, more than all of our wars together except the Civil War, every year. That's without a classification system. One person provides those documents out of how many thousands who could have done so. Jeffrey Wigand, an official, gave testimony to the same effect 
again, one of hundreds and hundreds, perhaps thousands, who could have done so, and he was the one who did it. So you had two people break that wall of secrecy without any threat of prosecution or classification or national security hanging over them. Uh, look at the Catholic Church and the generations, perhaps, of egregious child abuse, ruining the lives of very, very many people in their care, uh, of which there was perhaps one. I heard of a whistleblower the other day for the first time, named a priest named Thomas Doyle. My impression had been there wasn't a single whistleblower who went outside the system, went outside the bishops, outside the church, to prosecutors and others, and to tell the victims. Out of how many tens of thousands of priests and nuns who knew that this was going on, and bishops, and knew that people were being terribly harmed by it, in addition to the extreme hypocrisy of people who were actually not only purporting to uh, lay down the law of morality in sexual matters, uh, while themselves being protectors, not just of homosexuality, it so happens they were opposed to homosexuality and made life hell for a great many homosexuals in over generations. At a time when the church itself, it turns out, was, as one person has called it, a, a protective society for homosexuals, partly in view of their celibacy rules. But beyond that, a protection society for child rapists. A horrible situation. The point I want to make is that without any threat of prosecution, no threat of being a traitor or unpatriotic by revealing these truths, simply unloyal, disloyal to their organization, their church, and to their careers as priests and nuns or bishops, that kept silence about this human degradation over decades and decades, up till the present, still being covered up by the Catholic Church. So prosecution is not essential to get this kind of performance. Likewise, in other parts of the government, dealing with climate, for example, and other matters, or regulation of the pharmaceutical industry. And then you have the in-in corporations, the asbestos issue, the uh, various pharmaceutical dangers that have arisen. Monsanto. <clears throat> Thalidomide. Yes, Monsanto. Some of the yes, things they've yes, been yeah, getting yeah, at. Too. Any number of them. Again, you don't need the threat of prosecution. When, however, you have a classification system because there is a legitimate need for some secrets from foreign powers, you can be certain it will be abused and will be used, and not just in an aberrant occasional way, but what will come to be the heart of the system, the, the major part of the system. That means that somehow we have to, if we're to learn what we need to learn to be democratic citizens and to avoid catastrophes, reckless and hopeless and criminal policies like the aggressive war against Iraq or the hopeless war in Vietnam and Afghanistan, deadly wars. To avoid those, you have to challenge the secrecy that makes them possible. 